Chapter Twelve of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. I think as much. Another thing that Ben had forgotten was Miss Webster's scheme for setting Daisy up in business. He thought of it at dinner time when he saw the dolls set in solemn rows about the study and heard Daisy's grave remark that she was afraid they felt crowded, but it was the best she could do but it was two days before he had a chance to talk the matter over with his mother. Daisy was close at her side all day, and in the evening Mrs. Bryant went out to care for the sleeping baby while its parents were away. Meantime, he did not wait for Daisy's absence to settle that other question. They were at the tea table when he made a bold dash into what, for several reasons, was hard for him to say. Mother, does what I earn at the store help you a good deal? Yes, indeed, said Mrs. Bryant, with great heartiness. You will never realize how much it helps, Ben, until you come to be the provider of a family. Perhaps you won't even then, with a bright little laugh which really covered a sigh, because it is just possible that your pocketbook will be so well filled that you may not realize little helps, but I can assure you I do this was a bad beginning ben was so silent and grave over it that his mother watching him a moment hastened to add not but that i believe we could get along with less if you see your way to better things in the future by taking a little less wages now and line said oh mother i don't see how we could the worst of it is ben said at last finding that his mother was waiting for him in some anxiety that I don't see any way to earn a cent anywhere else, and yet... Then he came to a period. It was very trying when they were all so anxious. Line felt as though she would like to shake him, and even gentle Daisy asked, Why don't you tell about it quick, Ben? I think as much, said Line. Have you lost your place, Ben? I'm sure I don't know what we will do if you have. We just manage to live now, and that is all. Said Mrs. Bryant, Be quiet, Caroline. Ben, my boy, tell mother what it is that troubles you. Have you had any accident at the store? No, ma'am, said Ben, low-voiced, and wishing with all his heart that Line and Daisy were both asleep. There hasn't been any accident, only I've been thinking a good deal about things lately, and I'm afraid some of them you wouldn't like. I know I don't. The long and short of it is, mother, he said, gathering courage as he thought of the sprawling boy on the ice and of the laughing comments. They sell cider at our store, lots of it. Sweet cider, they call it, but I don't think it is very sweet, and... Another period. Have you been called upon to sell cider? Mrs. Bryant's face was growing pale, and there was a dangerous flash in her eyes, such as her children seldom saw there. Oh, no, ma'am, of course not. There wouldn't be any chance to think twice if I had. But you see, mother, the boys like me pretty well here in town, and they drop in there to see me, and get in the habit of taking a glass of cider, when maybe they wouldn't if they didn't come for my sake in the first place and then, anyhow, a fellow doesn't feel exactly consistent somehow to be in the store where the thing is going on when he has such ideas about it as I have. Mrs. Bryant was not through with her supper. The bread had given out, and they were having a treat out of a cup of sour milk and a stale loaf from the baker's. The two, with the help of a little soda and salt, had changed into some delicious flannel cakes, which had made Daisy wish that the bread would always give out just at supper time, so the evening meal had been prolonged beyond its usual length. But Mrs. Bryant laid down her knife and fork, and came with a quick step to her son's side, put one hand on his head, and with the other lifted up his face, and deliberately kissed it. "'And you do not want nor mean to stay there,' she said. "'God bless you, my boy,' If you had given me a hundred-dollar bill of your own honest earning, it would not have begun to give me the pleasure which those words do. Of course you need not stay, not another hour. We can manage, even if you find nothing else to do. 
said line in her most emphatic tone i think as much as for ben he had a chance once more to contrast in his own mind the difference between mothers on his way home he had occasion to stop at mrs kedwin's to deliver a large order for dried peaches and had stood talking with rufus a moment during which they had discussed an item of news joe bailey has gone to peterson's saloon as a clerk announced rufus he gets real good wages too did you know that mother no said mrs kedwin take the applesauce in dinah jane look out for that stew it is burning i wish folks didn't have to have stews and all sorts of things for their supper after having a good dinner it doesn't seem necessary i'm glad of it rufus his mother needs good wages if anybody does and joe will save some of them for her i suppose though he isn't the best boy in the world i'm afraid mrs kedwin always had to mix her conversation with directions to the girls about tea or baking or some household care she rescued two dishes from a tumble and gave three more orders before she replied to ben's dismayed exclamation why peterson keeps a liquor saloon well he keeps oysters and other things too still i suppose joe will have to help at all of it it seems too bad but i don't believe he'll take to liquor he has had such a sorry example set before him in his own home he was quite a big boy when his father froze to death after a drunken spree i should kind of hate to have him there if i were mrs bailey but what can poor folks do they have to take what work they can get and work is very scarce in this town i'm glad you've got a good place ben i hope you'll hold on to it and i know you will for everybody knows you are a good steady boy and your mother needs your help and then ben had gone home to the supper table and the flannel cakes and told his short troubled story because he felt that he mustn't dally with his conscience another minute that something happened all the time to make it seem harder to take a stand was it much wonder that the contrast between mothers struck him forcibly so now he said to himself it is plain sailing as far as mother is concerned what a tip-top mother she is the next thing is what will mr sewell say what he said was to argue with his young clerk to assure him that he had given satisfaction and would be sure to rise in time and then to do what was a very unusual thing for mr sewell actually offer him a little more wages and then as it finally became necessary for ben to own that he had no other place in view that he was very anxious to work that his mother needed the money and that the cider barrel was the sole thing in the way of his staying where he was mr sewell after taking it pleasantly as a sort of joke at first and trying to argue him out of his position grew positively angry called him a fool declared that he would give him no recommendation whatever and that he hoped it would be a long day before he found work that he did not deserve that all this palaver about principle was just an excuse for getting a chance to loaf around in idleness and that he would ruin his mother with his pig-headedness as his father had before him with his bad habits serves me right said ben drawing himself up to his full height and looking as manly as possible all this abuse serves me right mr sewell for having been mean enough to go to work in the first place in a store where they sold hard cider for sweet if my mother had known it i wouldn't have stayed here an hour but i never thought of it at first i wonder how i could have been such an idiot and i promise you i never will be again whereupon he walked out of mr sewell's store resolved never to enter it again trembling he was so that he could hardly walk the idea of that man insulting the memory of his father oh to have been able to say it is false and you know it my father had no bad habits my father was always a grand true man the mean mean fellow he said aloud burning with indignation when he knew my father reformed and for years and years before he died never drank a drop how could he bear to say such a thing as that to his son if he had not been on the public street a long way from home i think ben would have broken down and cried outright 
so keenly did he feel the sting of the insult which had been given to his father's name like all insults the bitterness of it lay in the fact that it had about it a shade of truth but it was something which must be borne in secret not for the world would he have let his mother know what that man had said he brushed away a few of the bitterest tears that had ever gathered in his eyes and gave himself at once to the wearisome business of looking for a chance to earn something a vain look so far as this long day was concerned there was not even a horse to be tied to a post or untied for some lady driver there was absolutely nothing all day by which he could earn a cent to carry home at night and though it was the middle of the week mr sewell had refused to pay him anything for this week's work assuring him that he had forfeited it at the same time refusing his offer to stay the week out as ben had supposed he must in honor do i'm glad he did not require it of you mrs bryant said when told that part of the story very glad indeed i would not have had you two more days more in company with a cider barrel for all the money a month's wages would give me it was certainly very nice to have such a mother nevertheless ben's heart was heavy during the two days that followed not a thing to be found to do he had not even the pleasure of trying the new machine and making himself useful if possible to mr reynolds for that gentleman sent word that he had unexpectedly been called out of town and would not be able to see him until the following monday a fellow might study lots if he only could ben said gloomily to line as he stood beside her while she washed the dinner dishes on the afternoon of the second day but you see my mind is so upset by having nothing to do that will bring in anything that i can't make it take to figures or dates or anything i believe i will learn to sew you and mother seem to have work enough here give me that cloth i can dry these dishes anyhow occasionally he found himself wondering whether it might not be possible that the pleasant-voiced young minister might know of something he could get to do twice during the afternoon he was tempted to go and see yet something held him back i am glad on the whole that he did not go because of a little conversation which miss webster had with the minister that evening after ben had gone that is an unusual boy richard miss webster said he has a good face said the minister he is a good boy i am deeply interested in him especially just now then she told about the mother's circumstances and ben's desire to help and the cider barrel and the disturbed conscience i shouldn't be surprised if i could find employment for him said the minister can you i hoped you could but richard i wish you would wait for a few days until he works out this problem by himself i hope he will leave there even before he finds other work and i think i even hope he will have to wait a little while after he has left before work comes to him it will make him stronger for the future i believe i see your point said the minister smiling well we will wait and see let the will assert itself so far as it is able so on the whole i am glad ben did not go to the minister just yet that evening he found opportunity to lay miss webster's scheme about daisy before his mother i don't know she said smiling and sighing after it had been fully talked over it is very kind in miss webster to think of it and i do not know but it might be the beginning of help in a very small way but daisy is the queerest child who was ever born i think sometimes there is no telling what she will think of it i almost fancy she will oppose it and i shouldn't like to force the child into anything of that kind mrs bryant was found to understand her small daughter better than line and ben did they declared that they thought she would like the scheme very much but she on being told of it looked not only grave but deeply grieved mamma oh mamma she said in the most distressed tone imaginable a tone which had also a touch of reproach in it sell my children what if i have a great many suppose you had thirty-five children 
oh dear said mamma well but mamma i know you haven't but just suppose you had would you like to open a store and sell them would you now really even if you could make as much as a whole dollar every little while daisy exclaimed line while ben leaned back in his chair and gave the first hearty laugh he had indulged in for two days you are the most ridiculous child who ever lived i am sure but daisy was grave and firm mamma would you think of such a thing for a moment little daughter said mrs bryant controlling her inclination to join ben's laugh as she saw the distress in her child's face there is not the least doubt in my mind that i would not think of such a thing for a moment not if i had thrice thirty-five children but dear child do you remember one thing my children would have souls which would live forever have yours poor daisy she looked down at the bit of work she was doing for one of the thirty-five choked and swallowed and had much ado to keep back the scalding tears while she faltered out i play they have mamma yes my dear i know you do and that i think would make the tremendous difference between your case and mine that is my little daughter's gravest fault perhaps that she plays too seriously i like to have you use your imagination to a certain extent dear it is worth a great deal at your age to be able to do so but there is such a thing as carrying it to an extreme and i have sometimes been afraid that you did so not merely in this case but do you remember how hard you cried when arabella aurelia fell into the tub of soap sods though it did not hurt her dress even and you knew it wouldn't however for daisy's head was still drooping and it was evident that she had nothing to say we will not talk more about this now you will never be obliged daughter to carry out any plan of this sort unless you wish it would probably not amount to very much in any case and if you do not like to think of it as one way of helping you to learn how to be a little business woman you need not you are still too young to have heavy griefs if mother and brother and sister can shield you from them and if you really love the thirty-five with all your heart we shall never consent to the sale of one of them we shall find a way out of our perplexities without that sacrifice i feel sure of course we shall said ben heartily i shall find work very soon mother i feel it in my bones to-night and daisy need not part with one of her children i sympathize with her so do i said line poor little mouse i remember just how i felt when my rag dolly dropped into the soap barrel and had to be burned in many ways they tried to cheer their darling and make her feel that the thirty-five children were safe and most welcome but for all that she made up her mind only a few weeks thereafter to part with them the processes by which she arrived at that conclusion were very queer End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen. There is a difference. For weeks after that talk with her mother, Daisy wandered about the house in a disconsolate and preoccupied way. It seemed not possible for her to settle her mind to anything. Even a new book, which came to her through the post office from D. Dunmore herself, a lovely history of real happenings put into such delightful story form that line said it was just as fascinating as though it hadn't happened had hard work to hold daisy's attention long at a time she had such a difficult question to settle should she go into business with her dollies set a price on them and actually sell them and have them carried away from her it seemed beyond belief it was in vain for her to assure herself that her mother was right and they were not truly children and it was extremely foolish in her to act as though they were but then would poor daisy's heart say to her common sense in a sorrowful undertone neither am i a truly woman 
i'm just a little girl and things have to be real when i play or there would be no pleasure in playing nevertheless the bryants were very poor to add to their anxieties the mother herself was sick for one whole week not dangerously so at least she said it was only a cold and the pain in her head was only neuralgia but it kept her from her work for more than a week and that meant serious additions to their anxieties daisy felt sure of it though very little was said before her the mother did not help her with her problem though more than once petitioned by both line and ben to do so mother why don't you tell the mouse to keep her dear thirty-five and be joyful in them ben would ask and add heartily i'm at work again and i see a way to earn quite a little before summer and we can manage i feel sure then line would come mothery don't you think daisy looks pale the poor little mouse is worrying i'm afraid about her dollies couldn't you just tell her there is no need for her selling them i really think it is almost as hard for her as it would be for what she calls a truly mother to do such a thing then would mrs bryant smile and shake her head though she looked a little bit anxious at the same time i don't think it wise to interfere children daisy is young to deal with such questions but at the same time in some things she is older than her years it is the ever-repeated question which has to be fought out in all lives sooner or later shall i do for myself or for others that is shall i make self the object or only the means to an end i may be talking above even you two she would add with a wan smile you are so patient under the cares and responsibilities which generally belong to men and women instead of to such young shoulders as yours and you are so intelligent and appreciative that i am sometimes in danger of forgetting that your minds are young then would ben and line exchange quiet glances which said as plainly as words could have done poor mother dear mother we will never let her guess that we are young we are old and strong and she shall lean on us and they would sigh almost impatiently sometimes for the days when they could lift from her every burden they felt sure the days would come after a moment of silence mrs bryant would try to explain further besides i am more than doubtful about the wisdom of encouraging daisy to make play life so real her imagination needs guiding or checking i hardly know what it needs and i hardly feel competent to deal with it but i am quite sure that she must come to a decision about this matter all by herself i feel sure that she will if we are quiet and patient and that it will be a decision which will help her in the future but mrs bryant was mistaken daisy did not reach the decision without help instead one of the forlornest little girls who lived on smith alley more than a mile away from the little brown house of the bryants helped her the early spring days were upon them while this grave question was pending some of those deceitful days often belonging to early spring when the sun shines warm and bright and the early birds appear and the summer makes believe she has changed the plans of years and is just at the door coaxing the buds to swell before their time wooing young ducklings who have come into the world early along with all other too early things to take some delightful swims in the pond wooing the foolish children to coax to wear their thin dresses and leave off shoes and stockings for just a little while wooing some foolish mothers to give consent by and by there comes a day when the ducklings are sorry they are born that the birds sit in ruffled up balls with one foot under them and wish they had listened to reason and stayed in the south when the buds on the trees wish they had not swelled when the hoarse sneezing croupy children wish the spring had not made believe arrive and then let winter and frost and coughs and sore throats in at the door she left ajar when she retreated all these things were happening this spring in the town where the bryants lived and though daisy her mother being sensible still wore her thick plaid dress and her winter shoes and stockings there were children especially some living on smith alley 
who kicked off their worn shoes and ragged stockings which truth to tell they sometimes did even earlier than this because they were too worn to be kept on and rejoiced in the pretense of summer it was on one of those lovely afternoon deceptions that daisy coming with line from mrs martin's with a basket of spring sewing for line to do saw a sight which filled her with pity and dismay two children from smith alley bare as to feet and ankles ragged as to dress uncouth as to hair and hands one of them perhaps ten years old and the other a wee baby of a creature played just above the stream where some silly ducklings swam what the argument had been or how she was persuaded into thinking it the thing to do daisy did not know but just as she crossed the bridge above where they were down went the younger ones soiled and ragged and battered dolly into the water the ducks were astonished and hurried away from it they need not have done so the current was swift and the dolly herself made all speed down the stream out of reach presently out of sight the loud wail which arose from the younger smith alley child as she saw her treasure disappear went to daisy's very heart she threw it in herself she said to line horror in her voice she drowned it how could she oh how could she hush daisy said line she wanted it to swim i suppose like the ducks she thought it could daisy dear how foolish for daisy was crying bitterly it was only a worn-out broken doll oh dear said line to herself mother is right these things are all too real to daisy what shall i do with her we can't go through town with her in such distress but daisy had already checked her sobs and was waiting for the smith alley children to come toward them the younger one being born in her sister's arms and still crying passionately yes ma'am explained the girl in answer to line's question she thought it could swim you see like the ducks she is so little you know poor little young one she loved her dolly so much no ma'am she hasn't any other this was all the one she ever had it was broke but she loved it never mind sally don't cry any more father will hear you maybe the suggestion seemed to hush the wild crying a little daisy could not imagine why but line could and her face darkened over the thought are you mrs zimmerman's children she asked yes ma'am said the girl we live down there at the end of the sawmill or behind it in that red house line nodded and drew daisy's hand in her own to lead her away she did not know what more to say but she felt that she understood perfectly why the mention of father had quieted the almost baby old joe the worst drunkard in town was mrs zimmerman's husband she explained a little to daisy as they walked away she thought it might be well to withdraw her thoughts from the drowned dolly he is a drunkard daisy the father is and very cross to his children when he has been drinking which is most all the time i have heard that he whipped that little girl once until her flesh was so sore her mother had to wet cloths all night in something cooling and lay on it why don't they put him in prison asked daisy in wide-eyed horror i don't know they can't i suppose besides sometimes he is good and kind and works hard to take care of them all and kisses that very little girl it is only when he has been drinking whiskey that he is bad then why does he drink it he can't help it he says he is a poor weak man you know who has done wrong so many times and learned to want the whiskey so much that when he goes by where it is and smells it he can't let it alone he wants to i heard him say so and he will go without for weeks and then a time will come when he can't seem to let it alone but line why don't they why don't men good men help him and put all the whiskey where he can't ever get a smell of it or buy it if he wanted to ah said line setting her lips firmly in a way that she had when she felt that she could say a great deal if she wanted to 
but knew it was better not to do so that question is too hard for me to answer you must go to some of those good men and find out however daisy didn't she went home to her study and her own little chair and took arabella aurelia in her arms and sat silent and thoughtful for a long time with the traces of tears still on her face at last she came to her mother arabella aurelia still in her arms mamma you know that story we read last sunday about the boy who had his tenths i remember well couldn't he i mean couldn't anybody give tenths of things as well as money why certainly if their things were such as could be divided i knew a man who did that with his garden and his wood lot and indeed all that he had when there were ten baskets of potatoes dug he had the tenth one laid in a heap by itself to give to the poor when the cabbages were brought in each tenth one was laid aside when his wood was drawn to town to be sold he said the tenth load was the lord's this is sometimes a very nice way to do has my daisy anything she would like to divide into tenths i was thinking mamma if i went into business you know the voice was low but controlled and there was an air of grave resolve about her face such as had not been seen for days i could that is couldn't i wouldn't i have a right to give one-tenth of all my dollies to to other little girls who were poor and couldn't buy any would that be giving to the lord mother i certainly think it would daisy if you use your property to make others happy because you want to follow his rule of living he has promised to accept the gift as made to him yet while she made this grave explanation mrs bryant was divided as she often was when she talked with this queer little daughter between the desire to laugh or to cry she could hardly tell which well said daisy after another reflective pause still speaking in that grave womanly tone i have almost decided yes i may say i have quite decided to do it a long-drawn sigh finished that tremendous sentence of self-surrender i will go and see miss webster about the plans this afternoon if you will let me but mother there's one thing that seems to me i must have settled so that we will all understand about it always yes said mrs bryant in her most sympathetic and encouraging tone setting down her bowl of flour and drawing a chair to wait for daisy's further revelations this business was so important that nothing must be done in undue haste what is it little daughter mother i do not feel that i could ever ever in the world sell arabella aurelia oh surely not said mrs bryant with decision enough to satisfy even daisy no one would think of such a thing i am sure nor even give her away continued daisy her voice faltering a little over the words i do not feel that i could make her a tenth unless unless you know some reason came up which made me think i ought to do it it does not seem at all probable to me that any reason will ever come up said this wise and sympathetic mother i think you are quite right daughter and may rest easy concerning it in her heart she wondered whether after all she need be so much troubled about this little girl of hers was she not on the whole if more clinging less selfish than most of her elders and then mother said daisy it seems to me that i ought not to part with d dunmore bryant because she came to me in such a way that it does not seem quite like a dolly but more like a like a personal friendship said daisy choosing her words with great care and then she has that name you know i quite agree with you said mrs bryant actually resorting to a little cough now to cover a smile d dunmore bryant should never be sold or given away or at least not until you are a grown woman after that of course you have a right to change your mind but i do not think i would consent to it myself before then it was in this way and with this help that the momentous question was settled and daisy went that very afternoon to miss webster 
to get suggestions as to how to set herself up as a woman of business it was that lady's own sweet tact which caused her to select from her portfolio of engravings one which she gave to daisy for the study a personal decoration to signalize as a sort of memorial of this important time in her life the picture was accompanied by some very choice gilt paper so heavily embossed that it looked almost a truly frame when it had been prepared by ben's careful hand it was a quaint home scene across the sea a mother and father and some admiring friends all absorbed in watching the pretty motions of a year-old baby whose small plump hands could almost be seen to flutter and then draw back as he argued the question in his little brain whether he should give a spring after his father's whiskers or stay where he was daisy studied it with the gravest face after it was settled in its proper place in the study then turned at last from it with that curious little half-suppressed sigh as she said gravely to her mother there is a difference even in a picture there is a great difference i never had a dolly who had a look on its face like that baby dear child said mrs bryant that is a picture of a soul End of chapter 13、Patience and Perseverance. Meantime, Ben's affairs had by no means stood still. In fact, a series of things, some of which were wonderful, had happened to him. In the first place, Mr. Reynolds returned, and Ben went to his room, and was as completely bewitched and absorbed for the next two hours as though the typewriter had been a magician. At first, he made terrible work. The paper would run in crooked. Then, when it was conquered, Ben discovering that, like all crooked things, it started in a very trifling bit of carelessness on his part, the roller refused to run back without making a harsh, grating sound. Which made Ben feel as though all the machinery had been reduced to helpless ruin by his own hand, and which Mr. Reynolds said reminded him too forcibly of the dentist to be agreeable. It's a sort of sleight of hand, he said, coming to the rescue. You take hold of it in this way, not as though you were afraid of it, but as though you didn't care in the least how much noise it made, and give it a quick jerk, and the thing is done. Fact is, when it discovers you are indifferent to its movements and are simply in a hurry to get on, it gives over being hateful and slips into place. Then Ben tried it again, but it grated horribly, and he felt sure it was sleight of hand. You are still afraid of it, Mr. Reynolds said. Keep at it, you won't hurt the creature, and you'll conquer her after a while. And he did. Only a few minutes' persevering effort, and not Mr. Reynolds himself could make the roller roll into place more smoothly than it did for him. Next came a quarrel with the capitals. Small I's and small A's, where there should be capitals, insisted on putting in their appearance. That uppercase key Ben inwardly pronounced a nuisance before he became accustomed to it. He even went so far as to say to Mr. Reynolds, I should think there might be a thing contrived by which you could touch that with your foot or with something else than your fingers when both hands want to be busy at something else. Ah, said Mr. Reynolds, pausing in the busy race of his pen over the paper and looking up reflectively at Ben, as the man did with his music, eh? Perhaps there's an idea in that. Somebody ought to think it out. Ben did not know what the man did with his music. He was tempted to inquire, but Mr. Reynolds was writing again as hard as ever, and besides, he himself was having a struggle with the exclamation point. It seemed determined to take the place of every period he wanted. Very slow work Ben found it that first evening. Not a line had he succeeded in writing with absolute correctness, though he used up paper enough to alarm him, had not Mr. Reynolds kindly called it waste paper. And told him to use as much as he liked without any qualms of conscience. 
finding the position of the letters was such laborious business that ben was reminded more than once of the boy mr reynolds told about and who you will remember he shrewdly suspected was rufus kedwin who said he didn't see what folks wanted to write on machines for that he could write enough sight faster with a pen however ben being of another metal the only effect his difficulties had upon him was to make him resolve that he would conquer the thing capitals periods and all and that before very long too or his name wasn't benjamin foster bryant to this end he paused in his work long enough to make a careful diagram of the keyboard on a sheet of paper and place it carefully in his pocket mr reynolds noticing the silence of the machine wondered if he had grown weary of it and glanced up to wonder why he was scribbling on paper but as the machine presently went to click clicking again and kept it up with laborious steadiness for the next half hour he asked no questions presently ben was called to a new conjuring instrument come and look on said mr reynolds you might as well be learning how to manage the thing you will be wanting to print some notices on it or something of the sort one of these days this thing that i write with is not a pencil you see nor yet a pen it is called a stylus i don't use ink you will observe nor has it any lead in it it is simply a sharp steel point made to write on this stone i've nearly finished the page but you can see how the last lines were written why it is just common writing ben said wondering why he should be called to look on at such work that's all said mr reynolds just common writing but it will multiply itself in a most uncommon fashion you will see presently ben watched the writing finished the sheet of paper was laid carefully over another the whole fastened into a frame which looked for all the world like a slate frame and then to ben's horror mr reynolds deliberately took an ink roller which lay on an ink slate at his right and deliberately smeared the whole fair surface you've ruined it declared the boy speaking his thoughts aloud in his excitement looks like it doesn't it said mr reynolds cheerfully but the fact is i'm just getting the thing ready to be useful i wonder how many such processes are going on with people our miss webster would make a wonderful lesson out of that but i haven't the knack while he talked he worked a sheet of blank paper was laid on a blotting pad down came the frame with its blackened sheet over it went the remorseless roller like a grim little horror bent on destruction then the frame was lifted and behold a fair and perfect copy of what mr reynolds had written lay there there we are said mr reynolds in intense satisfaction works like a daisy just as she always does now my boy if you will proceed to making the copies i will enclose them in these envelopes which i have already addressed and we shall be ready for the morning mail before we know it after you get a little used to the thing i have a notion that you can manage the whole affair addressing and all and save my time for the other work which is crowding me ben thought to himself with much satisfaction that he could certainly manage the addressing he had not taken exceeding pains to learn how to hold his pen and acquire a fair round business hand for nothing he had been called the best writer in school many a time truth to tell it was the thing he had aimed for perhaps it would not be a surprise to you if i were to confess that this boy friend of mine was quite inclined to aim for the top in anything he undertook but he was just now too much absorbed in this new wonder to be able to give much thought to the commonplace matter of writing with a pen each fair sheet that he carefully laid on the frame and apparently ruined with the grim roller as it presented itself before him a perfect transcript of the copy filled him with astonishment and delight having made in the space of a very few minutes as many as twenty-five copies and finding that the power was by no means exhausted he ventured a few questions mr reynolds was engaged in nothing more formidable than folding sheets of paper and slipping them into envelopes he ought certainly to be able to talk what is the name of this thing mr reynolds 
that thing young man is a mimeograph isn't that a high-sounding name for you a wonderful invention it is of a wonderful man by the name of edison you may have happened to hear of him yes sir i have said ben speaking respectfully and in a subdued tone it almost took his breath away to think that he was really so near to the great man of whom he had read as to be using one of his inventions i have read about his machines and thought about them a good deal but i never supposed i should see one that is one of his latest hasn't been patented very long i've only had it a few months but it works as well as this every time did the first time i tried it in fact it is about as labor-saving a thing for a man who needs a good many copies as i can imagine i used to use their jelly pads and affairs of that kind until i got tired to death of them sometimes they'd work and sometimes they wouldn't oftener wouldn't than would for me and they were sticky messy things anyway i was glad to see the last of them how many copies are you getting my boy i don't think i want more than a hundred of that sort i have to keep watch of that creature she throws out a hundred copies before i realize what i'm about and goes right on adding to them almost in spite of me there's a kind of fascination in printing just one more to see if it will be as bright and clear as the others have been how many copies can you make of one writing asked ben his eyes twinkling over mr reynolds's queer way of speaking of all machines as though they were human beings that's a question i can't answer said mr reynolds as he laid a pile of sealed letters in the mailbox at his side ten fifteen twenty two i've got fifty-five of these ready just see how many more you have there i've printed two hundred and fifty copies and she has felt as fresh and lively on the two hundred and fiftieth as she did on the first how long she would go on in that fashion i can't tell not from experience i haven't happened to want more copies than that but next week if i have good luck you and i will try her metal a little i shall have a paper then of which i shall want to make several thousand copies i'll want her to copy the typewriter too which is a little more ticklish work at least it always seems to me so perhaps because i haven't practiced on it very long but she does it like a daisy a daisy must certainly have been mr reynolds favorite flower he always referred to it when he wanted to express special excellence the typewriter echoed ben can she copy that and then he asked no more questions he was dumb with admiration there was time for no more practice on the typewriter that evening but ben carried home the diagram he had made and displayed it to line while she was washing the breakfast dishes i'm bound to learn the thing this very day he said with a vigorous shake of his head the letters you know they had the dizziest way of flying about on that keyboard you never saw the like why some of the time i would have declared that there wasn't an h on the thing and yet there it would be right before my eyes i'm going to place every letter in my mind this day in such a way that it will have hard work to get out again there are only twenty-six of them you know pity if a fellow can't place twenty-six letters in one day i can do that as well without the machine you see as with it why so you can said line in admiration what a boy you are to think of things ben look here why wouldn't it be a good idea for me to learn them too i might practice on a make-believe machine daisy can make believe anything under the sun and i might follow her example in this and learn to write by imagination then when you get your machine you see i could do copying for you the sentence closed with a merry laugh but ben who smiled to keep her company did it in an absent-minded sort of way then suddenly burst forth with it's a capital idea look here line i'll make you a board a regular keyboard in wood with the shape of the keys marked on it all in their places and you practice moving your fingers over it writing words you know until you can do it like lightning all right said line still laughing but impressed with the idea nevertheless i'm sure i don't see why i can't learn a good deal in that way 
what ben learned that day may be gathered in part from mr reynolds who watched him the next evening in silent astonishment as he ran in his paper and after a few seconds careful study of the keyboard wrote without hesitation and without mistake a long paragraph from a book which lay at his side presently the teacher spoke see here my boy did you dream that out last night or make a machine and set it up to practice on or what you didn't learn the position of the letters like that last evening i made a machine said ben laughing a piece of one i made a diagram of the keyboard and learned it by heart to-day you'll do said mr reynolds but for what he would do he did not say he watched for a few minutes longer then went back to his writing with a queer smile on his face end of chapter 14「Fifteen of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen. Daisy as a Business Woman. Meantime, plans for setting Daisy up in business went forward rapidly. There was much talk as to how the store should be advertised. So interested were all parties concerned that Mr. Reynolds heard some of the talk and questioned as to its meaning then proposed that some posters or dodgers be gotten out made on the wonderful mimeograph this was delightful but the perplexing question was what should be put on them miss daisy bryant will open a doll store at her mother's house on saturday at ten o'clock this was the beginning of one of the dodgers ben wrote it on a bit of typewriter scrap paper spread it out on his knee studied it thoughtfully and shook his head i don't like it mother i can't exactly tell why that is i can't put it into words but i don't like daisy's name on pieces of paper blowing around town his mother smiled a little sadly as she said isn't that foolish ben my boy there is nothing wrong about daisy's going into business no disgrace certainly why should it not be announced on dodgers ben looked perplexed but not convinced i don't know he said again in anxious tone but mother daisy is such a little bit of a girl to have her name spread around and talked about and people asking questions and laughing don't you know what i mean i don't like it a bit if it was my name why of course and ben drew himself up proudly and looked as much like a man as a boy of his size could i understand mrs bryant spoke gently and sympathetically you want to shield your little sister from all that you can i like the feeling my son and hope and believe it will grow with your growth and develop with your manhood there is nothing wrong in spreading her name about but you would like it better to keep the name close at home well how can we advertise her business it will not do to say that benjamin bryant has opened a doll store ben laughed i should think not he said then relapsed into perplexed thought how would it do said line pausing in the hem she was making on miss webster's white skirt to announce the business in the name of miss d dunmore bryant people who know us would inquire what it meant and be very much amused i shouldn't be surprised if it would help along ben looked greatly relieved it takes a girl to think of things he said with a nod of admiration for the bright-eyed girl beside him i think that is a very bright idea one doesn't care anything about a doll's name being tossed about town and it would be a very unique way of managing where did you get that word line asked a little in doubt whether to be amused at ben's largeness in producing new words every little while or pleased with the evident strides his education was making what word unique oh i picked it up it is one of mr reynolds favorites he says things are unique when i should say they were odd only odd hasn't quite the meaning of the other after all mother i wish i knew french i'd like to know some language beside my own it would be such fun and a great many french words seem to me to be very expressive 
there is a great difference between unique and odd in my opinion his mother said oddity has an element of queerness in it while a thing may be unique because it stands alone in its excellence or beauty that's so said ben emphatically and once more he felt that little thrill of respect for his mother how much she knew that a great many nice good mothers knew nothing about and yet she had to take in clear starching in order to live she shan't always said ben drawing in his breath with a little sudden catch which meant with him suppressed energy biding its time but this he said to himself miss webster reads french said line i saw a whole shelf full of french books when i was there the other day and she asked me to give her one which had her mark in to read after i was gone it was poetry added line with a grave little sigh nobody but caroline bryant knew how much she wanted to have a first-class education mother it was daisy's soft voice which next took up the theme before them do you think if it isn't a nice thing for me to have my name put on on those dodger things ben told about that i ought to have d's name there ought i to have her put where it would not be nice for me to be how was anybody to help laughing over such a question ben shouted even after he caught a glimpse of daisy's grieved look and tried to control himself he burst forth several times and line's chair shook with her suppressed mirth as for mrs bryant even she could not quite hide a smile but she answered carefully daisy dear don't you think you ought to always remember the difference between dolls and people that question of souls you know reaches in every direction think a minute would it not grieve you to have your name in a place where brother ben did not like to see it i know it would now do you really suppose d cares daisy thought a moment then with a sigh much deeper than lines had been gave her decision why of course she doesn't but it is because she can't poor thing and it seems sometimes kind of like taking advantage of her not having a soul to treat her always without one it was of no use ben fairly doubled himself up to laugh and mrs bryant had to join in the mirth this time though daisy looked grave and wondering i don't intend to spoil the plan she said gently after a minute and i know line meant it for very nice and of course d won't care but it is hard for me all the time to remember that she isn't truly you know because i have made believe so long that she was there is a more serious objection than miss d's feeling i am afraid mrs bryant said one in which the golden rule daisy is trying to apply will fit i think if we do not like to have our little girl's name sent around town we must remember that d is named for a truly little girl and that her brother or other friends might not like it but they won't know anything about it ben said opening his eyes wide over this new application of the golden rule my son would that really make any difference with the principal if i have reason to think a person might not like me to do thus and so if he knew it am i necessarily freed from blame because he may not happen to know of it ben whistled an entire bar of hail columbia and broke off suddenly to say i beg your pardon mother but that is what i think i'll call a unique notion we'll sleep over all the notions said mrs bryant we may have clearer ideas in the morning bring the bible daisy dear it is time you at least were asleep the next day daisy settled the question but the way she came to do it is a long story it began by the sutherlands going to europe unexpectedly the son of the house reached a foreign port to remain for several months and sent them a cablegram to join him instead of closing their handsome house they rented it to acquaintances of their uncles in new york people who wanted to leave their town house at this season in order that extensive repairs might be begun on it and who were not ready to go to their house in the country 
because the season of mud and rain would soon be upon them. They called this good-sized town a sort of halfway stopping place, and were glad to get into the Sutherland home, and were glad to hear of an excellent clear starcher and ironer almost as soon as they reached the town. "'Perhaps she can do the children's clothes decently,' said Mrs. Irving, the married daughter. "'They haven't looked fit to be seen since I left home.' "'What is the name of the woman?' her mother asked. "'I don't remember. Brown, I think, or some such name. Dennis said he knew her, and would leave word for her to call and see about it.' Dennis was Dr. Sutherland's coachman, who was going to serve these new people while his master was gone to Europe. So, because of all these things, Mrs. Bryant sat the next evening in the little room off the kitchen at Dr. Sutherland's, and talked with Mrs. Irving about the children's dresses, and waited to give her opinion on the probable washing qualities of one that had been sent for, that she might examine it. By her side stood Daisy, a fair little girl as one need wish to see, with a face as sweet, Mrs. Irving thought, as any she had ever looked upon. She kept looking at the child while she talked, and thinking how sweet she was. Suddenly she spoke to her. "'Would you like to go into the hall, little girl, and see my children? They are all there with the kitten. They have a new white kitten for a pet, and are nearly wild over it,' she explained to Mrs. Bryant." my little sister is with them and she is about your child's age i think would she like to go in and see their new kitten now that i think of it my laura has on a dress i would like to ask you about so we will all go and the door was opened into that beautiful wide hall which was large enough for a reception room and where the children were at this moment engaged in trying to make a frisky white kitten with a blue ribbon about its neck keep her paws out of the bright tin of milk and lap it properly with her pink tongue why children this is hardly the place to serve kitty's meals mrs irving was saying and she had meant to add i have brought a little girl in to see you and the kitten but she had no opportunity daisy the moment her eyes rested on the taller of the group who stood aside looking on stopped short for one amazed second then with a low murmur of delight moved forward eagerly just in time to receive the other's impetuous embrace as she shouted it is daisy isabel bryant and you are d dunmore murmured daisy in sweet and shy delight i knew you in an instant knew me of course you did didn't i know you the very second i turned away from that kitten to see who was coming i'd know your eyes anywhere oh daisy isabel how is d dunmore bryant is she well do you live here can i come and see you and all the other dollies how lovely of course there were explanations to make to the bewildered mrs irving which resulted in the calling of mrs dunmore first and then the judge himself to see the little daisy whom he had always kept in kindly remembrance he carried her off presently to the library under pretense of showing her a good picture of d and her dolly which hung there but really because he wanted to talk with the sweet shy little mouse a few minutes away from the distractions of the other children d went along of course but the little irvings were left with their kitten and mrs dunmore took mrs bryant to the sitting-room to wait for daisy but daisy grave little woman as she was in the midst of all these distractions did not forget that she carried grave business interests on her shoulders and decided that this would be as good a time as any for learning from headquarters whether there was an insuperable objection to lyne's scheme for advertising she was a little afraid of the judge it is true but then said daisy to herself he will have to know about it and it would not be polite for me not to tell him myself, and I may never have another chance. So she bravely shouldered her cross and began, Dear Miss D. Dunmore. But here she was stopped by D. laughing and kissing her. Why, you dear little Daisy, don't call me Miss D. I'm just a little girl, you know, like you, 
and you needn't take the trouble to say the last name every time i'm just d and you are daisy though i've always called you daisy isabel and that sounds the most natural you interrupted daisy my dear said judge dunmore i was going to ask you began daisy and i mean i want to ask your father too if you would mind that is if you had objections to my using the name of my dolly in the firm for advertising you know mother thought it would not be right because you might not like it and we didn't ever expect to have a chance to ask you so we thought it would have to be given up but that was only yesterday and now since you are here i thought i might ask you about it exactly so said judge dunmore trying his best not to let his eyes twinkle with fun nothing more delicious than this little bit of gravity had ever before come into his library you are right i am sure but we don't quite understand d and i what firm is it and what is to be advertised and how can the dolly help why you see sir i'm going into business we need to to help along and there are so many dollies that we plan to have a fancy store and sell them i didn't quite like it i mean i didn't like it at all at first spoken with drooping eyes in which there were tears very near to falling because it seemed like selling one's children but miss webster thought it would be right and mother talked with me and dollies haven't souls you know they are really very different from truly children and mother said that i could have a tenth from them to give to some little girls who were poorer than i and that of course i need never never sell miss d dunmore nor my dear arabella aurelia and so drawing a long sigh heavily burdened with responsibility and care we planned it because it seemed to be right and best there was no twinkle in judge dunmore's eyes this time unless the shining of something very like a tear could make it he had to wait a moment before speaking and clear his voice which even then was slightly husky that sounds like a very sensible and altogether practicable plan in every way worthy of you he said gravely of course dollies have not souls and of course they should be made to help in every proper way i'm heartily with you but do not yet understand how d's little dolly namesake can help she is not to be sold you say oh no sir never said daisy quickly i couldn't ever do that and my mother thinks so too certainly said the judge we must have all proper respect for even dolly's feelings but how then do you understand it d turning to his little daughter why you see sir began daisy again it is like this the business must be advertised or how would people know there was a store and ben that's my brother made a copy of a a dodger i think they call them which had my name in and told about the business but he did not like it he did not like my name on it i mean he said i was very little to have it tossed about the streets though i don't see what hurt it would do just a name made of ink and daisy stopped to consider this perplexity for a moment but that was the way ben felt she continued and mother seemed to understand it then line thought of a plan it was this to put miss d dunmore on the dodger her name i mean not her picture and have the business conducted in her name because she is really a sort of queen among the dollies ben said and he thought it would be appropriate but mother thought of a trouble right away she said we must remember that my dolly's name belonged to a truly little girl and if ben did not like his sister's name to be put on dodgers and things he must remember that perhaps the little girl's folks would feel just so and that we hadn't a right to use the name on account of the golden rule ben did not quite understand it because he said we only wanted to use the dolly's name but mother said that was the way we ought to feel and so here daisy came to a full pause she was not accustomed to talking to strangers she was very shy of strangers but this explanation she felt had to be made now that it was made as well as she knew how 
she was very uncertain what to say next and was growing exceedingly uncomfortable the more so as judge dunmore was looking at her in a queer way and saying nothing as for d she looked from one to the other and did not seem to know what to say at last the judge roused himself so that is the way your mother argues is it she must be an unusual woman no wonder the daughter is but he seemed to decide not to finish that part of the sentence and commenced again i begin to understand it so you want miss d dunmore bryant to go into business an excellent plan give my compliments to line and tell him i think so but you did not explain who line was is that another brother no sir that is my sister caroline we call her line for a love name she planned it i beg her pardon she planned well i have no sort of objection on the contrary i so entirely approve that i shall take it upon myself to have a small window sign painted with my lady's name and the nature of the business in which she is about to engage you see my child what you said about dollies is very true however much their owners may love and care for them they have not after all souls and this may be remembered in our treatment of them now although your d dunmore bears a part of my daughter's name she is not after all my d dunmore but yours and there is that infinite difference between the two of which we have been speaking in the second place although she has the name of my daughter she also has your surname which is much more important don't you see how it is suppose a family named smith lived near to your mother's house they do said daisy gravely just around the corner from us do they indeed then that is so much the better for my illustration let us suppose then that they have a little girl and chose to name her daisy bryant smith that is perfectly reasonable and you could not blame them for wanting to borrow your name to place before their little daughter's surname neither would there be any danger of confusing the two for sensible people would have no trouble in understanding that daisy bryant and daisy bryant smith were two different persons but suppose for any reason the family had grown tired of the name smith and decided to borrow your surname and call themselves bryant that would be a very different matter and might cause you a good deal of trouble and in order to bear it patiently you would want to be assured that they had somehow secured the right to do such a thing do you understand oh yes sir daisy said with infinite gravity i understand and i thank you very much but all the same if you did not quite like me to use the name in this way i would rather not do it because i know i am a little bit glad that the smith baby is named charlotte ann smith instead of daisy bryant smith whereupon the judge drew himself back in his chair and laughed loud and long to the great discomfiture of daisy who had no idea what he could be laughing at nevertheless the matter was finished to the satisfaction of all two days thereafter there hung in mrs bryant's front window a handsomely decorated sheet of cardboard making in gilt letters the following announcement doll emporium season opens on saturday at ten o'clock miss d dunmore bryant proprietor end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen eben lends a hand while daisy's business was getting into such a satisfactory shape matters were by no means standing still with her brother ben with mr reynolds business was very brisk ben spent not only his evenings but a large part of his afternoons and occasionally a morning in helping he made great strides during this time in the management of the typewriter and mimeograph moreover he was learning incidentally a good deal about business methods which would be sure to prove valuable in days to come it was a very pleasant life to live 
and ben enjoyed every minute of it but between times had his hours of anxiety mr reynolds was soon to depart and with him would go his wonder-working machines and the occupation which now brought ben in quite a little sum of money after that what was to be done i've learned a good deal he told himself mournfully but after all it is not anything which will help us live after he is gone i'll have a machine some time but of course it will be years yet and i'm sure i don't see what we are going to live on while i'm earning one nor how i'm to earn one anyhow unless i get steady work somewhere it's a good deal as rufus says to look at it from the outside wasting time he says i am perhaps if i had anything in life to do that would bring in the money for mother i might think so but as it is my conscience is free this is about as far as his anxious thinking and reasoning reached he always brought up against what he called a stone wall which he could not see over and always decided that there was nothing to do but get what he could from mr reynolds and be as helpful as he could in return and wait for the way out of his perplexities meantime the way out was preparing all about him though he had not an idea of it three people were already very much interested in him miss webster mr reynolds and the minister from time to time they talked together about his affairs and made plans for him at least miss webster and the minister did and certain matters were in train at the time when a fourth friend appeared on the scene it happened that d dunmore herself had to do with this last experience she was on her way to the doll emporium it was nearly two weeks after the establishment of that important business and d it must be confessed was a good customer and spent much time there as she turned the corner and came to main street trouble began it happened that eben was out for a walk that morning all by himself now eben you will remember was a very wise dog and ought to have known better than to have lent himself to any such scheme as he did but even dogs will sometimes make mistakes and there is this to say for eben it was a mistake not malice aforethought the same cannot be said for the smith boys they turned the corner from the opposite street just as d did and met eben and her at the same moment they saw the little girl stop short bestow a doubtful troubled look on eben then go to the very outermost edge of the walk leaving him the whole broad sidewalk and prepare to pass him with great caution now the smith boys had made friends with eben and knew most of his wise ways here's fun said joe chuckling low little miss perky is afraid of eben let's get him to show off and see if we can take some of the starch out of her little miss perky meant d of course it was a name the smith boys had given her the first time they came in close contact with her at which time they had declared that she was stuck up why i do not know unless it was because her dress was very neat and her manners ladylike however it might have been revenge for having overheard her say speaking of them that she didn't like to have much to do with boys who had such very dirty hands still i do not know i am sure whether malice or only thoughtless mischief moved the smith boys on this morning the actions which spring from these two sources are often so very much alike as to make it difficult for a looker-on to judge this i know that the boys having whispered together a few minutes following d at a little distance as did also the stately eben called the latter and gave orders to him in low tones to shake hands with the little girl immediately eben tried to obey he trotted on fast and d as she heard his swift steps behind her tried to walk faster her heart beating hard the while but eben could trot faster than she could walk a moment more and his great paw was resting on her arm she meanwhile giving forth a terrific shriek and the smith boys bending double with laughter kiss her shouted joe between the bursts of merriment kiss her eben that's a good fellow 
and to dee's unutterable horror eben's great red tongue came up and tried to lick her cheek just what would have happened next whether dee in her awful terror would have fainted or gone into a fit i cannot tell for at that particular instant while she seemed fairly paralyzed with fear came a clear ringing voice from across the street whose owner took long strides toward them as he spoke off eben off i say come here sir don't be frightened little girl he would not hurt you for the world as for you joe and ted smith see if i don't report you to professor kelly before you are two hours older it was ben bryant who made these several speeches and the little girl who was now leaning against him too weak to walk and sobbing violently was d dunmore he was sure although he had not been at home when she made her calls on daisy and had never seen her before don't cry he said gently stroking back the wind-blown hair as he would have done daisy's own it was too bad to frighten you so eben is a grand good dog he would have behaved like a gentleman if those scamps hadn't told him to pretend he was well acquainted with you here sir don't you try to make friends yet you've been too bold altogether trying to kiss a stranger on the street too i'm ashamed of you go home sir and tell your mistress what you have done frightened as d was and still trembling so that she could not walk she could hardly help a faint smile over the ashamed and utterly discouraged way in which eben with slow steps and drooping tail turned on receiving these orders and walked away in the opposite direction from which he had been going he minds she said faintly oh yes eben always minds he is a good friend of mine i don't often have to scold him it is really the smith boys who need the scolding this time the young scamps what is all this asked a quick voice behind them my daughter what is the matter oh papa said d making one spring from ben's protecting arm into her father's hold me close papa i can't help trembling yet though i know there is no danger now this good boy would not let them hurt me oh papa and then d began to cry it was ben who had to explain which he did very briefly sparing eben's feelings all he could but not sparing the smith boys he said little about himself but d between her sobs helped out the story in that respect and papa he came across the street fast and called the dog and made him take his dreadful tongue away here d shuddered and oh papa i should have died i'm almost sure if he hadn't come that very second it was really quite embarrassing d was so grateful and her father who used less words seemed also so very glad that his little daughter had found a friend that ben who felt that he was being thanked for almost nothing was in blushing haste to get away i must go on he said quickly could the little girl walk with me to where she is going sir i will take care of her thank you said judge dunmore smiling i came out to join her in her walk but i am obliged to you for your thoughtful offer do you know who i am my friend yes sir i think you are judge dunmore i have seen you on the street then you are better off than i for i do not know your name will you tell my daughter and me who we have to thank for thoughtful kindness and care this morning my name said ben straightening himself as he unconsciously did whenever he spoke the name for which he had a great deal of respect is benjamin foster bryant but i don't want any thanks i haven't done anything almost before he had finished his sentence d had broken away from her father excitement and pleasure rapidly taking the place of fright and dashed over to ben's side again why papa she said it is daisy's good brother ben daisy says he is the best and dearest brother in all the world and i'm sure he is i'm sure of it i don't doubt it in the least said judge dunmore laughing heartily we are very glad to make your acquaintance benjamin and glad to learn that you belong to little daisy whom we love now i shall know where to look for you and will not detain you longer 
Ben went away, wondering why he would care to look for him, and wondering just what he ought to tell Professor Kelly about those scamps of boys, and wondering what Miss Webster would say when she heard of Eben's adventure. It was this little incident which made Judge Dunmore seek not Ben, but Ben's acquaintances, and ask some questions. Among others, he chanced upon Ben's former employer. "'Doesn't amount to much,' said that gentleman, with a significant toss of his head. "'What is his distinctive quality?' Judge Dunmore asked. "'Shirking.' Whereupon the judge raised his eyebrows in surprise. "'I should not have supposed that,' he said thoughtfully. "'He seemed to me a boy who had a good deal of energy.' energy enough only he doesn't like to apply it to steady work he had a good place with me and i would have done well by him i meant to and what did he do but up and leave me on short notice no other place in view either hasn't had a place since and won't be likely to get one very soon good places are not common for youngsters with no more training for work than he has had especially if they cannot stick when they get them but what reason did he give for such an extraordinary proceeding? He must have had some explanation to offer. Mr. Sewell shrugged his shoulders and laughed. The queerest excuse you ever heard of, he said, and the flimsiest. Of course I took it for what it was worth, and knew that it ought to be spelled for L-A-Z-I-N-E-S-S, -S, for that was what it meant. Why, he took a notion to make believe scared at an innocent-looking cider barrel, which stands in the corner of my back room. He had nothing to do with it, never had to wait on customers even, unless it was now and then a boy. But all of a sudden he got up an idea that selling cider wasn't the correct thing, and off he went. Did he indeed? said Judge Dunmore, with a smile on his face and a good deal of pleasure in his voice. That was certainly a very unusual step for a boy of his age. Where did you say you thought I might find him? So I told him, putting on airs and making himself out wiser and better than his elders. Why, I think you will find him hanging around that Mr. Reynolds, who is here canvassing. He has a room at the Widow Kedwin's on 2nd Street, and Ben has got bewitched over some fool machine or other which he carries about with him wastes half of his time there i guess it is a great shame and his mother a widow and struggling to make a living i was willing to do well by the boy as i said if he hadn't been such a born idiot good morning said judge dunmore lifting his hat in a courteous way and moving down the street with rapid step it happened that he was particularly interested in just such idiots as ben bryant had been his next call was on Mr. Reynolds, though Ben was not there. He had been sent to the express office with an important package. Mr. Reynolds was, however, in his bicycle dress, making ready for a long trip. The typewriter was packed, and in fact it was that which Ben, with his sorrowful heart, was carrying to the express office. Little Laura Kedwin and Eben came together to announce Judge Dunmore. "'Good morning,' said Mr. Reynolds, glancing around. Laura, I don't believe I can receive you and Eben this morning. I'm very busy. It's too bad. I'd like nothing better than a frolic with both of you. But I must get these papers done in time for the noon train. We didn't come for ourselves, Laura explained. We came to show a gentleman the way. He wants you. Ah, I beg your pardon, said Mr. Reynolds, rising in haste to meet Judge Dunmore, whose handsome face now came into view. "'He is a splendid young fellow,' said Mr. Reynolds heartily, as soon as he heard the object of Judge Dunmore's call. "'I never met a boy in whom I was more interested. He is smart, too, as well as faithful and in earnest. I've been uncommonly busy since I came to this town, and that boy has helped me more than the young man of about my own age who used to travel with me ever did in the same length of time, and he understood the business, too. Of course it was all new to Ben. Poor fellow, his heart is heavy this morning. He has just taken his treasure on a wheelbarrow and trudged away to the depot. 
does he know how to manage a typewriter judge dunmore asked after he had asked several other questions he certainly does better than some who have had a half year's drill he is uncommonly quick at taking up new things as well as uncommonly persevering why he made a board imitation of the lettering and practiced on it evenings at home the consequence was the next time he came he astonished me by making the machine go like lightning i call that an original idea it seems to me he ought to be in school judge dunmore said in a reflective tone that's exactly where he ought to be and there is a good school here where he could do well if he had a chance the girl ought to be there too but i suspect it can hardly be managed at present the girl interrupted his caller what girl little daisy there is enough time for her she may better play with her dollies a year or two yet than be confined to the schoolroom no no i don't mean her i mean the older sister thirteen or so perhaps a smart girl and a constant companion and friend of ben's he doesn't like to do anything in which line as he calls her doesn't have a share why she worked at this fingerboard with him until actually the first time she saw the typewriter she sat down to it like an old hand and wrote with remarkable correctness and a good degree of speed so there are two of them eh there must be a somewhat unusual mother oh there is my landlady says she is one of em which seems to be a mysterious way of conveying high praise he laughed with his mouth and his eyes and judge dunmore joined him merrily then mr reynolds began to talk again yes there are certainly two of them and they ought to be in school but the mother is poor has a little place burdened with debt i am told and these two have to stay at home and help all they can besides miss webster tells me it is a question of clothes though i think she has some scheme in mind to manage that part i have a little plan but i don't know that i can carry it out for years yet and by that time it will not be needed for i hope to see ben in congress or somewhere by the time i'm able to help him i'm young you see and have had quite a tussle for ways and means myself here his frank eyes met judge dunmore's keen gray ones and that gentleman nodded sympathetically so you see my little plan though a good one i do believe will have to wait perhaps not suppose you tell me about it i'm interested in the young people my little daughter and miss daisy are great friends besides i owe young benjamin himself a vote of thanks for a bit of work he did for me only yesterday whereupon he told the story of the smith boys and eben then mr reynolds talked eagerly describing his little plan i'm pretty sure it would work he said after giving much information and answering all questions i meant to try to work it up in some way if i stayed here but this order from headquarters to return to new york at once has upset a good many of my schemes as well as ben's you would have felt sorry for the boy if you could have seen his face when he was getting the typewriter ready to travel he feels that he is bidding good-bye to a friend as mr reynolds returned from showing his collar to the door a short time afterwards he stopped to pat eben on the head and say confidentially you mustn't kiss the girls old fellow unless they themselves ask it don't you know that however we won't scold you this time for i shouldn't wonder if you had made a pretty good morning's work out of it and he laughed his bright glad laugh end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: A Business Transaction. Business prospered with Daisy. It really astonished Mrs. Bryant to find that from the first there was a brisk market for dolls. One would think that all the little children in town had been forgotten or neglected until now, she said looking on one morning with a puzzled air while a woman from factory lane whom she knew only by sight 
carefully selected two neatly dressed red-cheeked misses as birthday offerings for the twins and counted out with great satisfaction her silver pieces in payment the woman overheard her and looked up with a smile i didn't forget mine ma'am nor neglect them exactly though they never had a boughten dolly in their lives and they will be six to-morrow but you see the way of it is that i never had a cent of money to spend on such things not once since they were born though many's the time i've walked up and down the street before the store windows and picked out what i would like to buy them and wished and counted and shook my head and been that silly that i cried a tear or two because i knew i mustn't do it you can't call that neglecting you know though they are to have their first boughten dollies to-morrow i think the one in the pink sash is a trifle the prettier ma'am don't you this last to daisy who gravely considered it while her mother continued the conversation are times easier with you now mrs dobbs the questioner's voice was sympathy itself her own sharp experience had led her to have always a warm heart for the poor mrs dobbs's face flushed slightly and she hesitated a moment there's not much easy to speak of she said at last we have none of us starved so far and maybe we won't though the prospect ahead ain't none of the brightest being a widow yourself ma'am you don't know how hard it is it's the drink that makes the trouble when he keeps sober there isn't a better provider in the town and he is that fond of the twins that he will get up in the night to see if they are safe covered if he hasn't been drinking but it seems that he can't pass hogan's saloon without going in and payday when he comes from the office he has to pass right by the door and hogan he keeps on the lookout for payday he's sharp hogan is and so it goes there ought to be some kind of a law against them places don't you think ma'am mrs bryant's cheeks were red now they had been pale for a moment then had flushed crimson so this poor woman really thought that she being a widow was too well off to sympathize what terrible burdens were these which made even death seem a relief she could not trust herself to speak her opinion of them places but line did yes there ought mrs dobbs and mother thinks so too there will be one of these days you see if there isn't mrs dobbs drew a long patient sigh as she said well indeed and i hope it won't be too late to help him it isn't as if he was ugly you see he is that kind when he isn't in liquor that the women on the street fairly envy me and he means not to drink he promises and promises and i try to believe him every time because i know he means it but the habit has got hold of him you know and habit is an awful tyrant ma'am mrs bryant had found her voice again and now spoke the thought which was troubling her perhaps my little girl ought not to take this money for dollies mrs dobbs you need it for so many things and children are quite happy without such things a little pillow with an apron tied around it does nicely or even a smooth stick my daisy has such a doll of which she is very fond you mustn't suppose you are neglecting your children because you do not think it right to spend money for such things i quite agree with you but the curious smile of satisfaction had returned to the face of mrs dobbs and she was eager with her answer oh ma'am it has all been taken out of my hands and i'm that glad that i don't hardly know what to do i'd never have thought of buying them not this season anyhow but for what happened yesterday you see the twins was playing out in the road and they had a stick like what you tell about for a dolly nothing in the world but a little old stick ma'am only it had a knot on it that they thought looked like a head and one day when he was sober he put some eyes and a mouth to it and a nose and it did look cute and i dressed it up in a bit of turkey red calico that i had left over from the comforters i made last winter for the factory men and they set great store by it and they was playing out in the road and laid it down flat in the road ma'am they ain't generally that careless but they forgot and a carriage came by fast 
and what did them horses do but step on that baby and break it right in two an exclamation of horror from daisy at this moment warned her mother that the story was growing too tragic what a blessing that it was only a stick she hastened to say oh yes ma'am it was but then there was the twins and if it had been real flesh and blood they couldn't have took on worse they sobbed and they cried and i didn't know what in the world to do with them i was sorry for em and fretted with them both at once i didn't know but i'd have to spank them out there in the street and yet i kissed them and tried to comfort them poor children said mrs bryant trying not to smile for line was laughing at the queer way in which the story was told though daisy was grave enough yes sure enough i was awful sorry for them but what was i to do the stick was broke right square in two and all mud and dirt at that and there was them too a screamin fit to rouse the neighbourhood and the folks in the carriage heard them don't you think though the horses were dashing along dreadful fast when they stepped on the dolly and what did that driver do but turn around at last and come back to where we was standing a fussing over that broke stick there was ladies in the carriage and children and a handsome gentleman who did the talking what's the matter says he the little ones were not hurt i hope well the twins was kind of took up with the horses and fine carriage and they didn't howl so loud so i had a chance to speak but then ma'am what had i to say i give you my word that i never felt more like a half-witted creature in my life than i did when i held up them two pieces of an old stick with some red cloth tied around them and tried to explain that they was a dolly and that the twins's heart was broke because it was broke in two i didn't know how i did it but they seemed to understand the ladies laughed a little which i don't wonder at i'm sure it was a ridiculous kind of a time and one of them said your life seems to be strangely interwoven with dolls nowadays father them was the very words ma'am i remembered them because they sounded so smooth and nice like music somehow though i didn't understand what she meant of course a grand gentleman like that hasn't much to do with dolls but he smiled and then he spoke to the twins just as kind and told them he was very sorry indeed for the accident that he wouldn't have had his horses do such a thing for a great deal but that they must forgive them because they were only horses and didn't know any better and a lot more nice pleasant things he said then he gave them each an orange and the ladies gave them some candy and one little girl a lovely child with curly hair and such pretty eyes twitched at his sleeve and whispered something and he said sure enough that's a good idea then what did he do but call me to his side of the carriage and while the twins was so took up with the oranges and candy and everything that they forgot to cry he gave me this very money that i'm laying down here this minute and says he now my good woman remember that it is only for dolls two of the best that you can buy for the money one for each of them it is no more than justice after what my horses have done then he told me where to go and i'm sure it is a nice place i didn't know there was such a place in town and i'll tell my neighbors ma'am and if they have any dolls to buy this is the place to come and he said again to me just as the carriage was going on remember mrs dobbs says he that money is for nothing else in the world but dolls and so you see ma'am i wouldn't have any right to spend it in any other way though i can think of a hundred things this minute that we ought to have but it wouldn't be honest you know that woman is the best stocked with ands of any person i ever heard talk line said the moment the door closed after her mother did you notice how they rolled out and tucked themselves in wherever there was a little bit of a cranny for them isn't she queer she is another victim said mrs bryant with a sigh and as she thought of hogan's saloon and of all the other saloons on dangerous corners and much frequented streets her heart gave a little throb of gratitude over the fact that the feet of her once tempted one now trod the safe and sheltered pathways 
prepared for those whom god has called away from all temptation and that they go no more out forever for the first time since mrs dobbs had appeared daisy now spoke mother that little girl in the carriage who whispered to her father was d i think i do not doubt it little daughter and the father who gave his money so freely was judge dunmore you are indebted to him for a great many kindnesses daisy but mother this was not giving was it with a little hesitancy and emphasis over the word i mean it was not giving to me it was just a business transaction don't you think certainly said mrs bryant with a little gleam of amusement in her eyes the sturdy independence of this small daughter while it pleased her was at times very amusing so far as you are concerned it may be called a perfectly plain business transaction yet people can be kind in that line as well as in others it was very kind in judge dunmore to remember you and send customers over here instead of somewhere else yes um said daisy thoughtfully i think it was but then mother well my daughter if he had not sent her here and she had gone somewhere else and bought dollies the man or whoever has them to sell would have been glad and now he can be sorry if he knows it because he lost this chance what about that mrs bryant laughed outright you are going too deeply into the question for me now i'm afraid she said you will have to take that thought to miss webster to talk over or perhaps to the judge himself he is a lawyer you know it is only a share in custom which you want though that is perfectly fair is it not i suppose so with a curious little sigh but then it seems strange some way that i have to be glad over what makes somebody else sorry things seem a little like that everywhere i think i would like a world where everybody could be glad at once there is such a world said mrs bryant softly a tender look in her eyes and a wistful going forward to the glad day when they should all be there as for line she looked simply amused these flights of daisies were delicious to her but daisy's face was still thoughtful though her mind had turned to another phase of the subject which came to the surface presently mother i am very sorry for the twins sorry for them exclaimed line think of those lovely dollies that will be in their arms in a few minutes the prettiest dressed ones in the crowd i believe i took special pains with that tucked skirt only yesterday i know said daisy they are very nice and i am very glad the tucked skirt was on one of them line but for all that it must have been terrible to stand there and see their wooden dolly crushed i cannot help thinking what if it had been arabella aurelia line's laugh rang out merrily then but her face also shadowed over after a moment and as she watched daisy out of the room she said mother whatever would become of such an unpractical little mouse as daisy if she had not you and ben and me to take care of her the lord can take care of his own said the mother and line was silenced from this date there sprung up a brisk business connected with factory lane whether money grew more plentiful there or whether each child in the region became so envious of the twins as to make it necessary to take some steps for their relief daisy bryant did not know but certain it was that during the next two weeks many new dollies went down that way to live and line was kept very busy evenings fitting out others to take the places of those who had moved queer little customers they had sometimes affording unbounded amusement to the older ones and opportunity for much philosophical musing on the part of daisy two neat and trim little dutch women came one day in their odd little caps and roly-poly bodies the older one with the quaintest neckerchief pinned around her throat and tucked into the waist in front after the fashion of her mother and grandmother line studied the costume carefully 
and declared that some dollies dressed in that way would take extremely well she believed and consulted d who happened to be present as to what she thought about it meantime but a few rods from the house a discussion was in progress among the dutch maidens only one had bought a new dolly and she was the younger of the two the other had brought her treasure somewhat the worse for wear close clasped in loving arms but alas for her mother heart its charms began rapidly to fade before those of the new and elegantly dressed dolly all in spotless white with tucked skirts and embroidered overskirts and a lovely white cape bonnet covering its head hilda seized upon it gave one delighted look at it then suddenly hiding its charms behind her held forward her own battered and bruised dolly with ink on its dress not only but also on its long-suffering face you may have my doll she said to gretchen my dear margaretta that you love so much all for your truly own and i will have this new dolly without any name for me gretchen sweet-faced and unselfish unworldly too put her small fat hands on her small sides and considered the question evidently not struck with the supreme selfishness of this offer she did love margaretta she had often hugged and kissed her sweet black face she had often rocked her to sleep why should she not let hilda have the new dolly who it was true had no name and take the one whose very name she loved it was line who interfered she and daisy were just starting on an errand when the customers came and had followed them in time to hear the discussion oh no said line hastily gretchen's mother would not like that gretchen must take the new dolly home to show her mother she is the one who bought it you would not be honest hilda to take it from her the dolly has a name its name is frida instantly were gretchen's arms outstretched to receive back her treasure but hilda would not yield she thrust the doll farther and farther behind her and stood back on her sturdy little heels and declared she would not give it up and resisted line who tried to coax her until finally it was settled by the coming of a stout german woman who was watching in the doorway near at hand she took hold of fair gretchen with the air of one who had a right to manage her called her a little simpleton for letting go of her dolly wrenched it with no gentle hand from hilda's grasp giving her a smart slap on her fat arm at the same moment and bidding her go about her business line and daisy went about theirs the former laughing the latter only sober line what made you say that dolly's name was frida this was her first gravely put question oh to help the little thing get back her own she has a big sister named frida whom she loves very much and i knew as soon as she heard the name she would assert her rights but line was it quite true oh yes i named her you see that very moment she was without a name and had to have one so i named her they can change the name if they do not like it you know but i feel certain that that dolly will be named frida from this time forth silence for several minutes then daisy mrs hutchins was nearly three weeks naming her baby before she could find one nice enough and you named this dolly in just a minute and that hilda was willing to give up hers just because the other was newer and prettier another minute of silence then a sigh which came from the depths of daisy's troubled heart as she said dolls are very unsatisfying line it isn't any of it truly is it End of chapter 17